Good morning and welcome once again to another episode of Logistics with Purpose. Christy, how are you doing? Good morning. Uh, good morning. I am thrilled to be here. We have been anticipating this episode for a while, haven't taken the lid off of it and let the cat out of the bag yet, but we are here and we're so excited to be talking to Hope Solo, star athlete, dedicated activist. You already know who she is, but I'm going to tell you more about her anyway. She is one of the world's top goalkeepers who helped the U.S. women's soccer team win bronze and gold at the World Cup championships and two Olympic gold medals. Um, in fact, in case you didn't know, she is the most decorated goalkeeper in U.S. soccer history. And after her record-setting career, she's been a tireless advocate for women's rights and gender equality, two very good uses of her time. Hope, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the show. Enrique, Christy, it is a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, we typically start off this podcast by asking about someone's um, childhood, but for obvious reasons that will come later, we're going to save that for um, a few questions down the line. But of course, we have to have you on here and we have to talk about your illustrious career. It has been so fun to follow. Um, I'm a huge Olympics fan, even though I don't know much about soccer. I watch it um, every time the Olympics are on. So I remember watching you and your professional journey is also one that millions of people around the world are familiar with and actually watched unfold. Um, your trajectory started in high school, college, and then you turned pro. So you've been at the, in the soccer world for a long time, and it was evident that that was who you were going to be. But I'm curious from your side. So we know you, of course, through soccer, but was soccer always part of the plan, or did you start realizing how good you are and we're going to go down that route? Um, and what would you have done if, if soccer hadn't been your path? Isn't that the question? Yes, it is. <laughs> what would I have done? I've yes. said a number of different things. Um, I want to be a beach volleyball player. Oh, another good one. But no, it, at the end of the day, I mean, when I was 12 years old, my stepfather and my, my mother sat me down and said they could no longer afford for me to play travel soccer. And it was a really difficult conversation for them to have with me. They knew I was enjoying it, you know, but there's, a, you know, there's club ball and there's select, there's other ways to play the beautiful game, of course, but I was successful on my club teams and I was making district ODP and I was, I was getting the self-confidence, you know, at, at a very young age. And, and in that moment, I just threw a fit like any 12 year old girl <laughs> would do, preteen, <laughs> threw a fit, said, how could you, I am going to prove you that I'm getting a, a scholarship to play soccer in college. And I started crying. I ran up to my room and my mom and stepfather, um, you know, he passed in 2012, but bless his heart because the moment they had that conversation with me, they knew it was my passion. It was mm. embedded inside of me. I had a love for the game and I wanted to succeed and they could see that I put my blinders on and I was focused and they did everything to help me um, continue to play. And it was very difficult on the family because, you know, we're very middle class and you know how expensive, um, you know, this rich white kid sport has become in the United States. So it wasn't an easy road. We were doing car washes. I was mowing lawns and cleaning homes and wow. yeah, getting donations and getting grants. And I had um, a lot of help from my community and my state to help me succeed and, and really fulfill my dreams. At the end of the day, I needed support. That's fantastic. And I feel With like that, that was said, I, I want to tell you, yeah, please, it wasn't an easy road. I, I had those blinders on. Um, but then I got cut numerous times, you know, okay. from the 1999 oh. team, the 2000 Olympic team, the 2003 World Cup team, oh. the 2004 Olympics. I was finally the third string alternate goalkeeper in Greece, which I do have a gold medal for. Yeah. But I got cut so many times that I started to wonder um, you know, maybe it's time to get an office job. Maybe it's time to fall oh. back on my, uh, my, my college degree and which was not what I wanted it to be. I was supposed to minor in Spanish. Enrique, you can help me. Perfect. We could actually it. switch this whole interview. to. <laughs> right I still have the biggest regret that I did not, um, become fluent in Spanish. Oh, so I was yeah. supposed to minor in Spanish and economics was my major. And because I was traveling the world, trying to make the U S team and going to camps, Wow. I ended up with my communications degree. <laughs> hey, fellow communications degree right here. <laughs> well, it's um, it's amazing. It's such an inspiring story, right? Because there's so many people out there hearing and listening to yeah. this episodes, and there's always like a something up 
uplifting, something inspiring about people that just don't give up. And and I love that, right? About some people. And how do you so how do you do that, right? And you come from 12 years old playing to becoming one of the greatest goalkeepers in the history of the sport and really breaking every single record. You still hold at least six in the US alone. So uh and, and you kept being caught. How do you I mean, how do you keep going? What kind of value system or culture or trick can you uh share with us? I wish it was easy advice. I wish there was one trick. Um, you know, you're you really are a product of your environment. You're kind of an accumulation of everything that you're surrounded by, whether it's um leaders in your life, coaches in your life, um even your monetary situation, the way you were raised, your values. So there is no one answer. What I, you know, what we tell our kids now, and when I look back to how I was as a kid, I loved being good. I'm, I, I, I'm not sorry to say that. It is fun yep. to be great at something. And I never felt guilty. And I was a kid out there, you know, coaches would take me off because I was scoring too many goals, right? And I, I find it now it's really difficult sometimes for young girls and young boys to stand out. Um, and so what we tell our kids, we don't care what you do, but whatever you pursue, try to be the best at because it's fun to be the best. And if you don't succeed, you know, um, maybe, maybe that's wrong parenting <laughs> advice, but it is what motivated me. But also what motivated me were all the people in my small, small, small right urban town, um, rural town, I'm sorry, um, who didn't think that a girl like me could make it across the mountains, mm. um, could get a scholarship to make it out of my hometown. I remember rumors about me being spread. I'd be gone for ODP camp. I'd come back and everyone thought I went and had, you know, a baby and I was pregnant. I mean, there were, there were rumors all over my small town because I was successful. So in that same breath, you have a lot of people questioning, doubting, and, and really um, not believing in you. So it was a fine balance of people telling me, hey, be the best, you could be the best, you know, stay focused, um, do not let your behavior off the field dictate where you go. And on the other hand, I have just as many people saying, hey, you're just a small town girl from a small town, you need to, um, you know, make realistic goals. And realistic goals for me, according to these people, including my athletic director back in high school, was telling me that these goals are too, too big. You know, it's, and I get it, you know, I, I dreamt very big, um, but I did the work and I stayed focused. So I don't know what kept me motivated. There's a number of things, these women in my life, my incredible grandma, um, my incredible black belt mother, who was the captain of her own boat, um, you know, in the eighties when it was only men on boats. My grandma was the first minister in Eastern Washington, um, female minister, of course. Um, so they were always kind of breaking barriers for me. And I, I had this strong sense of, a, of, you know, they were opinionated, but kind women. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like I could ask questions and speak up. And, and at some point, you know, when you go through advocacy and work, you start to realize that you're asking a lot of questions that perhaps you don't want to know the answers to but um so these women they made me uh speak up and stand up for myself and believe in myself and believe that I'm a part of this man's world mm -hmm. and then I had these you know my father and and he was he was homeless and and it, he was a huge part of my career also he loved me and I knew in his love and he supported me in a different kind of way so long answer but what i'm saying there's no one answer you have to work hard you have to stay committed you have to find that love inside of you and then you have to try to be the best because being successful is fun i don't care what anybody says <laughs> no thank you thank you so much for that advice i have two young kids one of them plays soccer and uh, and you're right it's like uh the adversity that kind of like makes good players and good people and inspiring individuals in this world so maybe because of that adversity is uh why well, you became so successful and Sure enough, you you broke uh, a lot of barriers for a lot of women uh, that came after you and after that very successful U.S. soccer team or football team for everyone listening in Europe. <laughs> uh, well, I guess everywhere else in the world. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that.
I, again, as a huge soccer fan, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you, uh, how does it feel? I mean, I, I've dreamt many, many times of going out of the tunnel and into the pitch and you have the national anthem. And then how does it feel to win a World Cup? It must be unbelievable. Oh, the World Cup victory. <laughs> that must I mean, it was, it was a... on penalty kicks too, right? Wasn't it? No, no, no. We lost in penalty kicks in a, a 2011. Before. Right. Um, it really was a, a just a long journey in the making, and it very well may not have happened. And that's kind of how I went into it after what happened in 2007, where our team really self imploded. Mm -hmm. um, horrible leadership with our coaching, just just chaos in 2007. Um, yeah. But we still got bronze. And then in 2011, one of the most beautiful tournaments I have ever played in hands down in Germany, packed stands and stadiums, that soccer intelligence crowd, football intelligent crowd. Um, we were, nobody wanted the United States to win. They wanted Germany. So they wanted Brazil to upset the United States. And we have that epic match between Brazil that went into to penalties where we tied in the last minute, but it was just beautiful. And and what why it was so beautiful is because I saw, um, I saw humanity in that tournament. Mm. You know, there was an earthquake, the tsunami that hit Japan right before the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And we were unsure if the Japanese teams were going to make the tournament. And for the morale of their country, they came and they put on a display of such heart and motivation that transcended the game and really just gave hope back to their destruction communities where there are people who are still missing and they're watching their their women's team play in this huge tournament outside on any television they can find. And I do believe we were the better team in that final, uh, technically and, and more fit, but Japan was playing with something that we didn't have. And it was for the morale of their entire nation in a devastating time. Yeah. And after the game, when we lost, um, I remember going up to Captain Ayumiyama and she couldn't celebrate. I had maybe a few tears, you know, but I was happy for them. And it was the first time I was actually happy for my opponent. Wow. And she said, Hope, I, don't, I can't celebrate because it breaks my heart that you're sad. And I hugged her back and I said, it breaks my heart that you don't celebrate. This may happen only once in a lifetime. And we embraced and we hugged and she went on to celebrate and it was truly the most remarkable tournament, wow. but yet we got silver and it sucked to lose, <laughs> to lose at least it's to Japan. Right. Um, but still one of the most, most beautiful memories I've ever had in competition. So four years later, you know that anything can happen. Whatever happened in 2007 was chaos. 2011, this team is playing with more heart and soul and, and for the sake of their nation. And you just know that at any given time, any team can beat you. So going into the 2015 World Cup, I approached it like that. And I made sure my teammates understood, hey, we may be the favorites and we're feeling good and we're feeling confident, but it doesn't matter on paper. Nothing matters on paper. And that's how I went into it. So in that final, when all of a sudden, it I don't even, I think it was 3-0 at halftime. I don't remember. Carly Lloyd scores the 50-yard goal. We go into halftime, it looks like we're winning, but there's still 45 more minutes and you're up against Japan again, you can do anything. A and great so, team too, right? It's Amazing really hard team. to start believing in victory. Wow. And that was from all the lessons, you know, prior. So when that final whistle blew, I, I couldn't believe it. I mean, we very easily in my career, Abby Wambach's career, Shannon Box's career, the veterans career, Christy Rampone's career, very easily could have gone down in history of some of the great players that never won a world cup mm. so we did it and i just oh i remember looking at my husband and just oh i was so proud after all of the uh we had a very turbulent year going into the world cup personally um so i think i was able in that moment to walk away from the game um and and be okay with it it was never easy to walk away from the game or be fired <laughs> but well you're still playing i assume or no are you playing seven on seven or somewhere <laughs> no, you know, yeah. no? Goodness, that's, that's a whole thing. Kids story. around. <laughs> yeah, my well, kids I still, are. I still try to play in practice. That's awesome. 
And of course, we have the Paris Olympics coming up in a few months. Um, I am constantly uh, glued to the TV for those two weeks. What was it like playing for the U.S. in that capacity? What is it like to play for the Olympic team? Well, I mean, you want all of your medals in every major tournament. You want the gold medal in the Olympics. You want the World Cup, you know, yeah. trophy in the world in the World Cup. But the tournaments are very different. When you play in the Olympics, you feel so much national pride, mm. um, but you also see all of the international pride, you know, and it's it's more of a, a circus. It's madness. It's celebrating every sport from every nation. It's beautiful. It's but it's it's exhausting because mm. you are, uh, you know, you might be staying in the Olympic Village and walking miles to get to lunch. Um, and when you're you're in a tournament, you want to be really focused. You want yeah. to keep things simple outside of the big game. But the Olympics, they provide a different challenge. Okay. They make you focus um, amongst the madness and the chaos and the, the circus-like event that the Olympics is. It for it really shows who's kind of the more mature players and the veterans. And it's a good experience because when you get into the World Cup, it's all focused on soccer 100% of the time. Um, so it, it's just a completely different experience, but you want to be on both podiums at the end of the day. Sure. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, I did not see the world cup game, but I was on the edge of my seat. You should be a sportscaster. <laughs> I didn't know where that was going. <laughs> um, well, as previously mentioned to you, once you moved on from soccer, you had, well, and even during your career, you were very passionate about women's rights, gender equality. We saw that both on and off the field. So I'd love to know what did that look like in practice while you were playing, um, let's talk about that section of your life first. What did you and your, what did those teammates, uh, co conversations with your teammates look like and those actions look like? And um, yeah, what were those kind of efforts like whenever mm -hmm. things were really going through major changes? Oh, goodness. It was decades in the making mm -hmm. um, to get the majority of our, our players to stand up against their own employer. Um, for so long, we asked, we were nice in negotiating. We asked for favors. We um, we kind of believed somewhere in the gray, nothing was set in stone contractually. Um, and it was kind of the way a lot of, you know, uh, Historically, women have really done business, um, being scared of their male employers. Um, we, you know, going back to asking a lot of questions um, early on on the team, I was wondering, you know, very obvious things now, but why are the men taking charters and we have literally economy middle seats back by the bathroom going to major tournaments? We stayed in some of the most absurd hotels that weren't even safe. And nobody wanted to question the authority. Nobody wanted to question their employer. We just wanted to be happy and play. And that was, that's what was drilled inside of us as women. Hey, just be appreciative and just be happy that you have an opportunity to play for your country. And I get that as a starting point, but in the United States, we have laws. And the law is the Equal Pay Act and Title VII. And I regret looking back because I knew things weren't right. I could feel it in my soul almost as much as I was passionate about soccer. I was passionate about women's rights, equal pay, um, making true and lasting change within the system. And so many times we got knocked down. I mean, you're going up against um, a major corporation who's been around for over a hundred years, who use the age old tactics of divide and conquer. They would take players out, say, hey, you know, let's just trust us, just calm down. We'll, we'll give you better hotels. We might see a better hotel once, but it still was not in initiated long-term. So um, it was very difficult to get everybody. And there was one time where um, through years of telling our players, we need new representation. We have to have new representation because we're not getting anywhere in these negotiations. Every um, new contract is an MOU, a memorandum of understanding, nothing set in stone. And so finally we had enough new turnover of players where they, they understood we needed change. And I'll never forget, we had a vote. I brought in a new attorney from the, the NFL Players Association, one of the best players associations in the world. 
And I bring in these attorneys to meet with the team. We had a vote and it was a split vote, nine to nine. So we didn't have change for another year. And I'm telling you, it took decades. But when Rich Nichols finally became our head counsel for the Players Association, he actually educated us on the Equal Pay Act in Title VII. Mm -hmm. We are grown women at this point. How come not every girl is educated in high school about the Equal Pay Act in Title VII? So that is one of my regrets. I should have been more in the know about my rights and, and the laws here in the United States, and I wasn't. And I forbid that for the generations going forward. And I think obviously the generations going forward are more educated because of our fight like ours. Um, but we we were finally educated about the Equal Pay Act in Title VII. And we finally got players on board who knew it would take a lot of risk. Um, our federation said they wouldn't schedule any games. It would take away our health insurance. We had moms on the team. People were intimidated, people were scared. So we still were playing it nice. Um, we finally, five players, me and four other players, decided to file with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, to get permission, you have to go through this channel first, this government agency first, to get permission to then go sue your employer if they find evidence that they might um, you know, not be in compliance with the Equal Pay Act. So it took them, because we had an administration change, it was going forward at full speed, with the Obama administration and then funding was cut in the EEOC by the Trump administration. Um, they worked really hard, but they just, they had lacked funding, they lacked resources. So it took another three years. And wow. then we got permission to sue our employer because they did find evidence. This was decades in the making. Wow. So when we get Everyone knew that it was uh, unequal. I mean, it's anyways, keep going. Oh, but, <laughs> not, but, the, but U.S. soccer would flood them with paperwork and documents, and it would take a long time for them to get through all the evidence. So we finally get permission. And at that point, the team wasn't didn't want to sue their employer anymore. Yeah. It was exhausting. I mean, I, I understand it. It's exhausting. Right. It's scary. It's intimidating. So at that point, I became the first athlete in the United States to sue their employer under the Equal Pay Act and Title VII. Wow. Congratulations. About eight months later, the team finally said, you know what? We're not getting anywhere. We need to follow Hope's suit. And they filed a class action. Mm. So we had a class action lawsuit. We won uh, you know, millions of dollars. Um, I dissented in the class action for a number of reasons. And I was able to get hundreds of thousands of dollars back into the pot for our class action to be distributed. Um, but it, it's been no easy process. I have been pushed out. I've been on my own island. I can't get work for sponsors within U.S. soccer. Um, it's It's been very difficult. I can't get, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've been on the board of Sports Fans Coalition. We work closely with congressmen and women. Um, and we passed the Equal Pay for Team USA, Equal Pay for Team USA Act last year wow. which is equal compensation to all olympians now not exactly. pro athletes but all olympians and we did that and that was that was me meeting with local congresswoman in the back of a bathroom <laughs> at the republican gop house in a very small town um with all trump supporters and i'm back in the bathroom meeting with this congresswoman to try and get bipartisan support so these are the things that are going on um it's it's a lot of hard work my husband uh he sees my ups and downs. Um, he sees the success and then the failures and how much time and energy I'm putting into it. He's putting into it to help me. Um, and it, it's no easy road, but that is the only road to create lasting change. And I am so proud to be a part of it. Well, thank you. Thank you so, so much for what you're doing. Cause yeah. yes, it's all amazing, but, uh, yeah. It is, and once again, another example of your perseverance and action um, as well that has certainly taken you far. That is an incredible achievement, something to be very proud of. Um, are there any other positive changes you've seen in the last decade or so just across the, the sport or professional sports in general? Yeah, I mean, of course. Um, the WNBA is thriving, you know, it, it, the NIL in college is really helping athletes out um, to dictate their own lives and, and decide, you know, from an earlier age, finding success and finding monetary success and being able to send money back to help their families. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a whole different era with NIL alone. 
name image and likeness um, yeah. that we see now in college sports. Um, women's teams are getting a lot more coverage on places like ESPN. Um, they're getting more pay. There's still obviously a lot of issues, but we've come a very long ways and I can only see it getting better. And actually the reason why it's getting better, many of it, uh, is because you see the money rolling in like FIFA and the success of the Women's World Cup tournament who wanted to turn a blind eye for so long and focus all their money and funds on the men's tournament. And then I think they realize you invest a little and you're going to make a lot in that investment. And that's what we're seeing now is more investment in women's sports. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wasn't well, it the women's, uh, in particular in the U.S., the women's national team has always been more successful. So that's just like <laughs> something else to add to the whole yeah. complexity of the problem because you were not only, uh, I guess, paid on fairly, but you were definitely uh, delivering the results a lot more than the other teams. So, but no, thank you so much. I have a younger daughter and I'm sure that people that are listening to this podcast are very thankful for, for all the fight and work that you've done to make sure that we have equal uh, rights and equal pay. And that's something very, very important. So hopefully everyone that's listening continues to push uh, for equal pay and uh, and it's very important for, for us going forward. I, I do want to say one more thing though. The fight is not even close to being over because my hope in suing our federation was to create a precedence for every woman moving forward, every woman in the workforce, not just women athletes. And we didn't create that precedence. Um, we never got that because there was a class action settlement. Um, my hope was to move forward through the courts, but now that is dangling fruit and motivation for the next generation. There's gonna be somebody out there who actually moves forward to create this court precedence that everybody can refer back to and that the deci decision-making for individual employers will be black and white. There will be no gray area. So that is out there for some, some team, some man, some boy, some woman to actually put it on the records. We should all kind of go and join uh, forces to get that done because you're absolutely right. And thank you once again. So Hope, changing gears a little bit here, um, we were connected to you through the Homeless World Cup. Uh, we had Mel Young participate in one of our shows, an amazing organization. I'm a huge soccer fan, football fan too. So for me, learning about this was amazing. How did you, how do you get connected to the Homeless World Cup? Um, well, I actually uh, ran for president for the United States Soccer Federation. And for months I went around uh, listening to the constituents and the voters and listening to real soccer problems on in the grassroots level on the ground. And I met so many people that are just doing incredible work in the game and for kids. And that's what it's all about, you know, and it's successful, you know, it, it helps your national team at the highest level and everything at the grassroots level is positive and good and building up. So these are the true heroes, you know, the ones in the youth game, the ones on the ground, the one doing these programs. And so I met uh, Street Soccer USA, Lawrence Kong, in fact, um, one of the members. Um, and I became a longtime supporter of street soccer because of the works they were doing in the local communities, um, because of the improvements they were seeing in the kids' math scores, social skills, emotional skills. Um, and, and just the fact that these coaches were so committed and passionate as much as the kids were and the kids were returning and it was making the community stronger. And I saw the work they were, they were doing and that through that, I realized, oh my gosh, and it was good soccer. I went to the tournament and everything and I was like, these players are amazing um, and competitive. And I was really inspired. And then I, I found out, oh my gosh, so winning, the winning team is gonna represent the United States in what? The Homeless World Cup? I didn't know there was such a thing. And they were so excited to see that the passion and joy that these these players were going to be able to represent their country in a World Cup. Uh, basically, you know, many times going from being unrecognized and ignored um, to being celebrated. And it was just a beautiful concept. And so I was going right then and there to the next Homeless World Cup. And um, lo and behold, I forgot my passport on the way to Mexico City, which was supposed to be one of the best homeless World Cups that have ever been hosted. That's what I've heard. 
Yeah. I still regret that very much. I did have my passport card. I did not have my passport. I thought it was the same kind of. Anyways, um, I was very, very heartbroken about that. So I was going to go to the next ro- Homeless World Cup. And then the pandemic hit. Mm. So the first Homeless World Cup back after the, the pandemic, I was finally able to attend. And that was this last year in, in Sacramento. Um, and, you know, I will definitely be attending next year and in, in this year in South Korea yeah. um, and hopefully continue forward because the work that they are doing is absolutely irreplaceable um, and it changes lives around the world. And I'm not just talking about kids here in New York City or kids across America. I'm talking about globally changing the impact of homelessness, the word it means, the recognition um, and, and getting people to understand that this is a global global problem with estimated 150 million people um, possibly homeless. And that's a very uh, hard term to define homelessness. I mean, it takes different definitions everywhere around the world. Um, Some countries think that if you live in a shelter, you're not homeless. If you bounce around on couches, if you get any government aid, so that it's very tricky to attack this global, global problem. Um, But that's what Homeless World Cup is doing. It is empowering, it is educating people and teaching people how to talk about the homeless community and really raising awareness. And so this is just the, one of the few programs that I wanna put my heart and soul into. It's, um, I had the pleasure to go to Sacramento too and I took my uh, son with me and it was just incredible, not only for for the tournament itself, but I feel like you're creating awareness and you're changing the lives of people that actually are touched by these players. And we had a chance to warm up and juggle with some of the teams. And I think my son ended up coming into the field with the Mexican team and the flag and just you hear their stories. And I was I was tearing up like every 30 minutes. And these guys, you see them, they're confident and they're uh, proud and they're um, self-driven. So it's yeah, very, very highly recommended uh, for anyone out there that's listening. And we'll put all the information about the Homeless World Cup. And you mentioned it. There's two events coming up that are of big importance, right? I feel like it's this, the first one uh, coming up in, in Seoul, right, in September. Which well, will be the first time in Asia, which will be amazing. I mean, that's going to be huge. And I'm very excited for that. But, um, you know, Netflix is coming out with, a movie, um, The Beautiful Game, which is inspired by the Homeless World Cup, mm-hmm. um, and obviously Mel Young and all the work he's done. So there's a couple big events. That's a huge event. Yep. And then uh, there's there's a, a, a virtual run, a 5K virtual run, run um, on April 27th and 28th. So we have a couple of events leading up to the big, big events. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so the, for everyone um, listening and watching, so this premieres on uh, the 28th of March. It's the 29th of March um, when you can look it up on Netflix, wherever you are. Uh, we're excited to see that. Bill Nighy is starring. I'm super excited I to see it. Great. I've already watched it. Oh, good. It's yeah, fantastic. I'm always in it. Oh, I, yeah, I will be bringing tissues. I'm, I'm really excited about it. And then um, the virtual run, as Hope mentioned, it is April 27th and 28th. So you can go to worldunited.com um, to find more about the virtual event, or you can go either way to homelessworldcup.org to find out about those two events. Um, I want to back up just a second because of your, you have a very unique personal background and personal history that also ties you to this cause. You mentioned um, that your father was homeless. I'm curious, as a child, did you understand that and recognize it? What was that experience like? I'm sure he had a huge influence. You said he was with you every step of the way in your career as well. So what was that experience like? Oh, Obviously, it was probably pretty tough for a young girl um, to not have their father around, to not understand where he was living um, when I'd see him again and things like that. But to be honest, you know, when I think back to those moments of speaking to my girlfriend in my room about, I remember one breakdown being like, I don't even know who I am and crying to her. But then it was just, I turned the page. My mom never spoke ill of my father. Mm -hmm. I had a great stepfather who brought a sense of uh, stable you know stability into the house household 
Um, but my father was homeless and I had to, I, my father, he coached the community basketball team. Wow. He coached my brother growing up in, in baseball. He coached basketball. He coached soccer. He was really gregarious and this big, loving guy, thick Italian, dark hair, tatted up, tattoos, thick New York accent. And he was a very prideful man, you know, Italian. Um, so I don't think he wanted his kids to know he was homeless, but eventually we found out. And when I went to college in Seattle, I thought I was going to go to the East Coast and get far away from my family life like you do as a teenager, again, 17, 18 years old. But I went to the University of Washington across the mountains, and I was able to really cultivate a, a, a incredible relationship with my father. And I never gave up on him. That's the wonderful thing. When I saw him those few and far between times, it was nothing but love. It was nothing but laughter, maybe a few tears when he hugged his big old belly. But I was able to forgive my father because I did realize that, you know, he was a Vietnam vet. Mm -hmm. um, he never really fit into societal norms of being that perfect father, that perfect husband. Um, and I understood that. And I was able to take away all of his positives. And he helped me become just a better human, you know, not judging others, uh, being kind to people, no matter what they wear, what they look like, their problems in life, what they smell like. Um, because for a long time, you know, I had to overcome those things with my father. He'd come to my soccer games in college and, you know, he'd been living in the tent in the woods for a week without a shower. Um, he'd walk away putting chips in his pocket from, from our VIP tent and my coaches, everybody loved him and were supportive and, and he was just a kind man. And so I learned so much in terms of, you know, not harboring anger. I never really had that. I had so much love. I wanted to understand his psyche, what he'd been through in life. And it helped me see things differently. And he helped me be able to slow down and enjoy the simple things mm -hmm. in life. And I think that's why being part of the Homeless World Cup and meeting the people like he did, Enrique, and hearing their stories, we don't know people's struggles in life. Um, we can ju judge from afar. Um, but when you go to an event like this, you realize perhaps me, myself, I needed it. I needed to be around these people with inspiration, with a lack of selfishness, um, complete selfless human beings who want to do better. And it's empowering. And they are the true motivators. Mm -hmm. Are these people involved in the Homeless World Cup, the coaches and the players and the administrators? I mean, these are the true heroes and the ones who inspire me now. And it does, it does my heart good to be around um, their fight for life, their fight against injustices, their um, learning how to be better humans. It's everything all of us want to be at the end of the day, but there's no selfishness in their journey. And that's why I find it so inspiring. And that's what my father was. You know, he didn't get it right every time. None of us do. Um, but he was a kind, loving human being who, uh, continue to enjoy life despite his struggles hmm. sounds like a great person hope what's yeah. his, what's your name what's your dad's name uh johnny solo <laughs> johnny solo such a catchy name <laughs> thank you for asking i haven't been able to say his name out loud in a long time that, that feels good well i'm curious um enrique could talk about soccer all day i'm still learning <laughs> um, I learned through the Olympics, um, but let's talk about your, uh, elite level, um, playing from such a young age. Um, and so we've talked again about your career. There's so much of you outside of your career though. And we've talked a lot about your passions, uh, but so much of it was defined for a long time by soccer. So what, what did you learn about yourself since retiring? Oh, since retiring. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> or maybe I should ask that? even since becoming a mom. <laughs> oh goodness, you know it was the first couple of years after I got fired um, in my fight for equal pay. Um, uh, I think I was ready. Um, I was ready to start a family. I thankfully had and earned that gold medal in the Olympics and the, the World Cup trophy. So I had gotten my golden gloves and being the best 
goalkeeper um, in the world, which was very important to me. So I had accomplished the things on the field that I strived to accomplish. I wanted more. Every athlete probably wants more. Um, but I was ready. And for the first three years, I was pretty good because we left Seattle, uh, my home state of Washington, to create a new life in North Carolina. And when I got here, we were trying to get pregnant. And, you know, we went, we went through a journey with that. But we're also building a home. So it's so much fun to work on your land and build a home and envision something new for your life and your, your family. And so I didn't have time to mourn soccer. I really did not mourn it. Everything was so new in my life. I didn't have time to mourn it. Mourn it. I was trying to build a home and have kids <laughs> and live in a different state. And, and uh, it wasn't really until, uh, I don't know, I think more recently, um, after the pandemic hit, you know, we had twins and the pandemic hit as we were in the hospital with the twins. Oh, wow. We came home and we're in a straight pandemic. And it was yeah. very difficult times. And I had to learn a lot about what I wanted in life. But I was, you know, I think like many of us, I was drinking too much um, in the pandemic. You know, after long days of parenting, it was, we had no help. We had no family around. It was very stressful times, but we were proud. You know, we didn't want help. We knew we could do it ourselves, my, my husband and I. Um, and we were there day in and day out being awesome parents, but then, you know, needing a drink at the end of the day. And uh, realizing that that got too far was very humbling. Um, so what have I learned, man? I learned that I love parenting. I'm an awesome parent. My, my husband is an awesome parent, but I've learned that we need help and we need support. And moving to the East Coast with no family, going through a p pandemic, you know, drinking a little more, yeah. we had nothing but each other. Mm -hmm. So um, there's been a lot of good positive change in terms of, you know, just realizing you can't do everything by yourselves. And, that, and that's huge because I always could in the goal and right. I always could help my team win in some capacity. Uh, yes, you have to rely on others. It is a team sport. I get it. But when it comes to parenting, it's a whole different challenge. And it's wonderful to be able to rely on my my family and friends again and, and the community and people around here because for so long we were isolated. And through that isolation also, I was mourning football again. Um, you know, going through these these losses and these victories with our equal pay and losing my work because of my lawsuits and losing my teammates because the Federation said, Hope is suing us, you can no longer talk to her. So all of a sudden, because of the having twins, being on the East Coast, being in a pandemic, and then your teammates being told nobody can talk to you again because of her lawsuits. I mean, I felt afraid and alone. I felt sorry for myself a little bit. Um, but eventually I had a wake up call and I got back up and I'm fighting again and moving forward. And that's, that's kind of life. And it's basically, um, it's, it is the story of my life anyway, picking yourself back up and moving forward. Mm. That's wow. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I mean, you're a force of nature and clearly you never give up and we're very proud to have met you and to have this conversation with you and we're fully supportive of you and your causes. And thank you once again for being here. Yes, absolutely. And this will, of course, we talked about some of your uh, female influences um, earlier. This comes out also during Women's History Month. Um, you are a role model. You've had role models. You named a few as well. Um, you also just talked about, it was good to say your dad's name out loud. Um, so let's also list some of the uh you know, let's name some of the women who um, influenced you and who influence you today and have shaped you. Oh, gosh, you guys are amazing. You know that? <laughs> Logistics with purpose, you guys do great work. Especially you, by the way. In UK, but, uh, uh, mi abuela's nombre, uh, Alicia Montero. Oh. Uh, my, yeah, I don't even know if I said that. My, my grandma's name was is Alicia oh, Montero. No, muy buen español. Muy no, buen español. Gracias. Um, uh, she went by Alice. Everybody knew her as Alice. Um, she was Colombian. And, you know, I was definitely, my mom was, is Judith. She goes by Judy. Judy Burnett. 
Fantastic. And she was an environmental scientist and a black belt in karate. Wow. So strange. So strange. But yes, those are the women who influenced me. Thank you for asking again. Yes, of course. Well, and we talk a lot about purpose. And of course, you're a very purpose-driven person. Um, this is the name of our podcast as well. So for you, what does what is purpose? What does purpose mean? Not only as an athlete and a businesswoman, but just as a human being, a mom, uh, someone from our community, what, what is purpose to you? Purpose, but I have learned about purpose. Um, you can't just have a wish, a dream, or an idea. Um, you have to do something about it. Um, you know, on the field, that equates to hard work physically and physical demands and getting in shape and having ball skills and everything it, 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 it takes to become a great athlete. Um, you know, when you're trying to make policy changes, um, you can't just have an idea. And I've seen that happen so many times. We've had ideas. We want to fight for equal pay. But at the end of the day, you have to have, once again, like I learned about parenting, you have to have a su support around you and not just your teammates. You mean congressmen and women. You have to have a plan. You have to have good representation. Um, we've had lofty ideas in the past, but I think you have to have a plan. And, and that's what purpose is, is knowing what your purpose is and then having it laid out to have a plan moving forward to do it. And having that support around you, of course. Okay. Absolutely. So, and for you, follow-up question, what does the phrase logistics with purpose uh, mean to you? Oh, logistics, I mean. Logistics with purpose. I think that's what it is. Have an idea, don't just have an idea, um, have a plan that goes along with it. And it has to be a long-term plan. Um, and you're gonna you're gonna take many losses, but you have to celebrate those victories, mm -hmm. and you have to keep adding to the victories to eventually have that long term plan stay in effect to create that lasting impact and positive change for for generations to come. So don't just start with an idea; get a plan laid out, a mm -hmm. long term plan, and be able to face defeats. Well, thank you once again for being here. It's been a real mm -hmm. pleasure. It's been a master class in so many different levels, and. Uh, Thank you so much for everything you're doing for the community. Thank you for everything you're doing for equal pay and women around the world. Uh, how can people contact you? I'm sure like a lot of our listeners would like to get in touch with you. What's the best way of doing that? Um, <laughs> I have been off social media and I think it's a <laughs> wonderful thing Good for, for a lot of people to take a break from. Um, but I still appreciate, you know, the love and support out there. Um, so you can still find me on Instagram and, um, and then obviously for speaking engagements and work and things like that, most people go through mile 44 and Melinda Travis. Perfect. Fantastic. We will include all of that. Um, and we want to remind everybody, of course, about the upcoming Netflix movie for the Homeless World Cup called The Beautiful Game, debuting on Netflix on March 29th. And the virtual 5K run is coming up at the end of April. So just head on over to homelessworldcup.org. Hope, thank you. This was wonderful. Appreciate your candor, your passion. Uh, I guess we would expect nothing else, but we still showed up and loved it anyway. So thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you out there and seeing what you're fighting for next. So thanks for being with us. Of course. Anytime. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can say that I'm a bigger fan of yours now, um, yeah. <laughs> not only for the goalkeeper that you are but then for the person you are so thank you so much i really appreciate that okay